Operator. I'm a software developer. I do a lot with Google Cloud platforms. Uh, here we have Noble, Axon, and Alan Rustenberg. Um, their topic is the ubiquity of connected uh, internet things. Um, one is doing audio, one is doing video. <laughs> so yeah, you guys are the judges, so I'm impartial. Uh, we're gonna know who wins this debate. Uh, hopefully these guys will uh, keep it clean. Um, so they're gonna put their futurist hats on and try to tell us, you know, why their side is better, audio versus video. Uh, both of these guys were heavily invested in Google Glass, uh, if you guys can remember that uh, device way back when. Um, both were so invested, one, Noble, uh, he built a startup with his uh, cushy job um, and went for it. Uh, Alan actually wrote a book on the topic. Um, so put their, their opinions in with a grain of salt. So without further ado, um, here they are. Before um, Alan goes, I'm going to because we actually showed you, or well, somebody who couldn't be here, showed you what it's like to be at DevFest where you saw kiosks and you saw video and audio of those experiences. So that's why I'm sort of stuck in the visual. Last year I did something with AR Core. Uh, and then Alan. And then, and then I've kind of uh, always been attracted to the audio component of it. So class was really appealing to me because I was literally speaking to it and giving it commands. And now I'm, I'm deeply involved with the Google Assistant, which is again, speaking to something and giving it commands and having that conversation to get things done. So uh, as Noble said, we've known each other for five years. Um, we're always having this, this constant tension of which is the better technology and where is it going to go? And I think that's where this debate came from. So a question for you guys. In five to 10 years, what do you think the living room of the future will look like? What do you guys think? We know, it, we know it's early, but what do you think? Yeah. I think it'll be full wall TVs that will be uh, interactive, your ability to touch, your ability to do motions to uh, interact with it. Full wall TV, so so there you are. What else? Yeah. Uh, tens, double digit number of screens. In the room. Lots of screens. A lot of them being cabinets on tables as opposed to on the floor. Okay, yeah. I see that, but I see that a bit more further in the future than 10 years. I feel like people need to adjust from a regular living room setting into something so techy. But I can see in the very near future with the sales of uh, things like Google Home, Amazon Alexa, audio stuff. Audio, voice driven, listen to music. Good agreement here. So, what about connected things, like things that may not have audio or video input? Nobody wrote what? What do we got in the back? Ready to one style VR glasses, this tiny broken room, and no one's going to care. So, you're going to be sitting in the closet with your VR controller. Okay. So far, I think I have the room, but go ahead. I don't know, I've got, I've got this corner yeah. here. All the, all the lights in the room and the window shades, et cetera, will be controlled by voice control. See, I think this is all the home we're describing of us. Right. <laughs> Not the home we're describing of the people in like urban areas. So, or so people in like, who are not in the tech community. So, so here's the thing, um, a few years back, uh, Google and the company they bought, Nest, kind of partnered up and started coming up with what their vision of the home of the future, of the living room of the future would be like, with kind of an understanding that we're not just talking about the living room, we're not just talking about the home, we're talking about our lives. What are our offices going to look like? And, and that's where this debate is going as well, is, you know, here is the living room from the 1950s. And we kind of see this very much as the living room of today and of tomorrow. It's a place where people live. It's a place where people hang out. And yeah, there are going to be some slight changes to it over time. Um, just like our offices have seen some slight changes. But you know, so, so I think it's, it's pretty cool that uh, back in the 50s, they, they envisioned these smart displays and, and voice control systems. I think that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. And actually, this is a photo that I was just 
totally improvised, doing a little bit of research for this talk, and this was actually titled The Living Room of the Future, right? When we talk about what does the future look like in the living room, uh, a lot of us sort of take different positions, right? We were visual species, we're visual species so we think wall-to-wall -wall TVs. Uh, and in some cases, we are familiar with what's available today. Uh, the ubiquity of sensors and, and, and microphones uh, that can just carry our voice and do things for us uh, uh, seamlessly. So with that, that's our positions. Um, Alan thinks. I think it's going to be audio. I think audio is what's going to be driving our interactions in our living rooms, in our workplaces, and everywhere we go. This is an audio-driven world. Well, noble thing. I disagree. I think it's going to be sort of heavily on the visuals, uh, video-centric. If you've ever been to, again, one of my talks, you know, right now we're in the nascent stages of what we can do with light fields, what we can do with, you know, presenting virtual things into our spaces or taking us to other places. Uh, and so I think that confluence with what we have today, an assistant, isn't going to be audio only. So, so let's get to it. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. So, smart speakers are the home of the future. And it's not just the home of today. What we're seeing with the technology that we've got in place now, things like the Google, the Google Home, the Google Assistant, they're what we have now. But if we look at what a living room has been traditionally, this is where people, families, have come together to do things. And if we go back a few hundred years, those things included playing music. If we go back a few score years, that's things like listening to the radio together, listening to audio together. When we think about having parties in a living room, we think about a bunch of people who are getting together and listening to music and dancing to that music. So this music is a very, very crucial social component. Audio is a very, very social interaction system. And that's why audio is one of the, the more crucial things, I think, in where we're going in the future. This social interaction, in fact, is, is really crucial because it, it highlights one of the big things about audio, and that's that it's two-way. So it's not just that my assistant is reading stuff out to me constantly. It's that I'm issuing commands. We are having a conversation. And conversations are something that are so inherently human that it's something that, that we tend to work with on a very, very fundamental level. It's why voice interfaces are very familiar and very easy for people to work with. And finally, I think voice really dominates a lot of things because it's also an ambient interface. I can just walk into a room and say, turn the lights on and have the lights come on. Or I can walk into a room and give instructions. Or I can walk, or while I'm preparing dinner, I can be issuing commands. So voice is something that we can do while we multitask. Because we as humans, we're not great multitaskers. But one of the things we can do is issue commands to be issued in the background while we're doing other things. And the only way, the best way we have to do that is our voice. <laughs> <laughs> but somebody disagrees. I, I, I do disagree. And it's very hard to argue uh, that, uh, about the impact that uh, smart speakers have had uh, on the world today. Um, if you look at what Google, Amazon, and others have done, I mean, 36 million households have at least one of these smart speakers today. If you, if you sort of translate that to sort of a curve over, say, what cell phones started uh, becoming, you know, sort of taking off, uh, that curve is a lot more steeper uh, than you know a cell phone, uh, than than, uh, than cell phones or you know computers or even you know landmines. Yeah, yeah, but you're not here to argue my point. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm conceding. You passed it on to me. My position is that humans are inherently visual beings. Um, sure, audio might have some place. Uh, in, in the ambience, but we today are a little short-sighted when we think that the future is going to represent audio interaction with our things. 
In my living room today, I have, um, you know, an entire village of things and people uh, and pets. They, the number one thing that centers us is a screen. It's a TV or a tablet or our phones. I think the reason why when Alan coaches and Google and Amazon coaches us on building uh, audio-only experiences, the reason why we're asked to test by closing our eyes is because we realize that we're missing a valuable con the context and, and the sensor, that the human sensor, which is our eyes. Uh, we, we aren't able to sort of leverage that. So in order to build real experiences for, for that medium, we totally forget that we have eyes uh, and we have touch. The thing about visual mediums is that it begs for more. It actually pushes additional sensors. Uh, being able to see something innately lets your mind want to touch it, which is where interaction comes from. Um, sure, I can look at my, I, I can talk to my, my home to tell my nest to do something, or I can just look at my nest and interact with it even if I'm a couple feet away. But I understand it because Kool-Aid drinkers like Alan uh, are blinded because they don't use their eyes when they develop for, uh, for, for, for this medium. Actually, I have more. But, but you, know, you, you say my eyes are covered, but your eyes are covered with the VR helmet. So I, I'm going to get into that for a second. All right, so in order for you to do what you do, as a developer, we build things. All of a sudden, we have to turn into radio producers in order to sort of set the stage, in order for us to understand interaction. We actually have to context switch and become someone by which we are not. But we have to learn, all right, right? But last year, I presented a tabletop experience of the metro system. We built it on stage. I didn't have a VR helmet covering my eyes or an AR device covering my face. I was able to go to the same tool that I use at Viewport in order to bring in an experience right here, I think in this very room, the entire metro system right on one of these tables. That is powerful. That extends the blindness that we experience through um, audio-only experiences. So all in all, let me go back and support this case and just conclude on that. Anything audio can do, video can do better. No, you can't. Yes, yes we can. No, you can't. Why wouldn't anyone want to build on mediums that fixes these basic challenges? Let's take a couple use cases. Weather. Hey, Google, what's the weather like? In his experience, you get the weather. But we're visual people. Google, the cast team, the cast API, now integrates with these audio-only sources and integrates with a screen in order to give you a visual representation, not only for what you're asking for, but predicting what you're actually also going to want to see. Let's take recipe instruction. Alan and I uh, did a, a design sprint on how to develop and test for audio-only experiences. In order to test it, we were standing back to back with each other so that, as to not anticipate what the other one was going to say, which is actually the standard medium in testing for audio-only ex experiences. But with a visual, uh, I can superimpose the ingredients so that I don't have to keep, I mean, by show of hands, how annoying is it to keep saying, Alexa, or hey, Google, every single time you want to get to the next uh, step of your gazpacho? It's annoying, right? All right, great. Let's take maps. Hey, Google. How long does it take to get to the Hilton or the Sheraton, right? You get just an audio display. And I'm, I'm a parent. I have two kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old, and a dog and a cat. We have a full house. I'm losing context all the time. But being able to persist something within my field of view is additive to that audio experience is thus better. Lastly, video calls. Well, you can't do that, so let's move on. <laughs> so now we're going to take the gloves off and, and just sort of defend a rebut and, and, and do the whole debate thing. 
Yeah, so, so you're launching at me first? I, I, I think I'm trying to consider that the launch. I, I think for someone who has been doing um, audio for so long, since we met each other uh, in New York at the Google office in Chelsea, you, you've sort of lost sight of presenting information when people need it and getting out of the way. Ooh, when we do it. That was the ethos by which we built true experiences. This, I built a fitness app. I started a startup with it. We did very well. This guy decided to build something called Voodoo. Guess what it did? Audio-based solution that allowed you to input stuff into spreadsheets. Snore. <laughs> Snore? Let me ask you something. Uh, fine, if, if we want to pick on Voodoo, sure, go ahead. Um, the sign of status in a top office is to have an assistant, right? So the big boss never says, never goes to their computer and looks up the sales figures for last month. What do they do? They hit their phone and they say, hey, Joe, what were the sales figures for last month? And Joe reads them out to him. He doesn't look at a spreadsheet. That's, that's demeaning. That's beneath him to look at something. No, he uses a command and he gets it told to him. Yeah. She sits in that corner office and she says that she asks for information and she hears what she wants to hear. That's the power, that's rapid communication in the concise form that you want it, where you want it, when you want it. Well, that's actually sort of leading you guys in a direction that you may not really, um, you know, you were the one that started in that direction. To, to be used, you, you, you may not be used to that. Because how many here, by show of hands, have a, an assistant at work? Uh, by the way, we're talking about home, so that your, your example doesn't really matter, but I did bring up food. You, you, you brought it up, right. so, that's so what that's, I'm saying. That's fine. And, and if you want me to counter, I will point out that, I mean, the, the great part about your action right. was that you had somebody literally whispering in your ear, constantly encouraging you what to do. Right. Giving you that cap for a Lynx Fit or for yeah. a fitness app. Your well, Lynx Fit, the well, Lynx Fit, your yeah. Lynx Fit, it was there talking to you all the time. That is true. Encouraging you. How much when you, you know, when you're doing a fitness workout, do you see things flashing on your screen saying, hey, only 500 push-ups more, you can do it. <laughs> no, you've got somebody whispering in your ear, a drill sergeant, you've got standing in front of you, shouting at you. What are you doing, Maggot? I, I need I'm 10 more. more! That's motivation. That's what voice is. It's motivation. Look here. I tell you what. The value add for Lynx, two things. The value add for the fitness app that used Glass, which is what he's talking about, was actually more impactful when I had a visual of my grandma standing in front of me telling me that uh, uh, I needed to motivate myself a little bit more. So, so what we actually learned was that when people got stuck, and needed to know how to do a burpee. Um, so switching from audio to video gave them more than just audio alone. The second thing I want to mention is about the assistant, uh, the boss that shouts to Joe or, or, or Larry or, or, or Laura uh, about what the sales figures are. There's an entire industry uh, called business intelligence yep. uh, that lives on the visual medium, dashboards. Graphs, executives, that persona. That well, but, but they live on the visual meter right now because that's what we've got. Right. But your we're, point, what we're getting is right. voice. All right. So I, I, I think I don't know. By show of hands, who's convinced with with the you know shouting commands to uh, uh, an inanimate object uh, to enter values into a spreadsheet? <laughs> and and come, come see a demonstration later. Yes, definitely. <laughs> and who thinks just looking at a dashboard and seeing fancy graphs, or looking, uh, uh, being immersed in your, your 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 bank accounts by just being able to manipulate the pie chart? So if I actually moved this thing from here to here, and the, the house actually grew, that means I know that I need to say, oh, let's take this pie chart, move it here. This house has gone smaller. So wait, I mean. Tweak it a little so, bit. so Noble, you really want to stand there and manipulate your, your household budget by, right. by waving around my gesturing thing? Minority report. <laughs> studies, studies have shown that 
cognitively, I'm able to understand more by visual representation. My mind interprets that. But that's visual that's representation. I, I just said visual control. Visual control, because I'm more immersed in it, I'm actually taking part. It's almost as similar to using a mouse and dragging something and manipulating forms in order for me to remember, right? Remember. Let's just, just take, take it this way. When you're practicing for a speech, um, it's always advised for you to sort of record yourself, right? To sort of see yourself talk. Well, but also to hear yourself talk. Well, with, that's why we're. I mean, that, that's, why it's called, that's, that's why it's called a talk. That's why video is better because with video, guess what we get? We get audio, right? And both work in concert to so, be better so, than audio. So okay, so you, you've dished on my apps. Let me let me toss something at you. The question last year, you had this nice presentation, this, this presentation of a 3D model of the metro system, right? And I was sitting in the front row. And my question to you at the time was, this looks really cool. What advantage does this have over the 2D map? And you kind of looked at me, and you never answered the question. So I'm going to ask you again. <laughs> and, this, and, and I'll even apply this to the living room. The living room has exactly one application that I think is good, VR is good for. And I will see this right up front. And that is games. VR is awesome for games. Beyond that, I haven't yet seen a practical use of VR. That's because you don't understand. Let me explain. With so, so you're saying it's too complicated for people to understand? I, I thought visual was supposed to be simpler. <laughs> let, let me explain it to you. Everyone here probably understands. <laughs> With VR, you and your family can be taken to an experience anywhere in the world. You and your family, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me, let me finish. Okay, okay. Let me finish. You talked about VR. Yeah. So let me finish. With VR, you can be teleported to any experience in the world while in your own world. Let's contrast that with audio. In the 20s, um, when the radio was invented, we had to be confined to a single space within uh, the range of an audio source in order to get the static and the audio, the news that we have. Well, newsflash for assistant lovers or Google Home audio only lovers, we're not in the 20s. We actually learned that even though dialing through the different frequencies, uh, we were still constrained to our space. Yeah, but what, right. we, but what we learned in the 40s right. from audio was how audio can take you places. Right. And in fact, how it could take you places much better than the movie reels of the time could. So we saw the audio reporting from World War II was tremendously more effective than the news reels from World War II. Sure. Because they had the person on the scene that could very, very easily directly transmit to you what was going on. You had a much bigger feel from the audio than from the video is what we were seeing. Sure, but also in the 40s, we realized that video change, changes worlds, changes governments. You had, and I forget the, the candidate, you had a difference between candidates, presidential candidates that did debates. That, that would be the 50s, and that, that, was, was, the, that was the 50s. That was 60s, and, and that, was, that was JFK and Nixon. J JFK and Nixon, thank you. Before JFK and Nixon went on their lecterns to debate each other as we're doing here today, you had an audio version that gave the listener some context. But we, we found out that with video, see being able to see another human on a tube somewhere halfway across the country or world, we were able to sort of better understand their state of mind, their body language, in order to inform us for what we did, and that is but, the analogy. But two things here. Okay, the first is you've got to also remember the JFK Nixon debate. People who listened to it thought Nixon won. Right. People who saw it thought Nixon looked pale and sick, and the reason was he didn't have makeup on. So, so you're won. saying video is fake and audio is real. So who won? The, depends who you asked for the debate. <laughs> but who won uh, the election? The election. <laughs> so now, 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 point two, however, is. You've dodged the question again. 
that I'm still waiting for the VR application okay. that actually is better okay. than its well, non-VR no, application. Your example was an AR application. So actually, I, I said VR. We well, you can go to the audio your table tape. We can go to the audio tape. <laughs> the example last year, the facts are the facts, was an AR experience, right? So where I said VR can teleport you uh, to a different world, AR actually brings different experiences from all parts of the world to you in your space. So that eliminates the need to sort of leave your, the confines of your environment. And what's more, where we're going with this is more mixed reality or cinematic reality or XR as it's called, where you can now interact. The sensors on the device that you're using actually sees what you're doing, what your environment looks like, and you're able to sort of manipulate that environment with your vir where virtual and physical meet. Now to that question about last year on that AR experience, you're absolutely right. With nascent technologies, I would have asked this, with all the technologies, I would have asked the same question. What good is a piece of paper to read the news? Why would you need the internet? It's the best way, way more critical thinking more engaged, it's not passive. That's your opinion. You want to come up here? We can debate. <laughs> no, we still have to agree. We've got a couple more minutes here. we got a couple more minutes. So AR brings you those experiences. They're more tactile. Where I can sort of, rather than sort of look at a piece of paper to see a map of the system, I can actually, actually in real time sort of see what stations are having problems. We all know if you've ever taken the uh, DC transit system, you know that there's always, always an issue. You can actually lift yeah, the train. But it, it. Yeah, but how long, you know, if you are taking the DC metro system, okay. what you care about is where I'm departing from and where I'm arriving to. And what I'd like is while my hands are full and I'm rushing to the station, yeah. to hear my assistant tell me, well, I'm busy doing five other things, my assistant tell me, hey, that train that you're running for is going to be two minutes late. So we're, we're coming close to the end of the argument side, but I want to end, I, I want to, you can have the last word, but I want to sort of end with one thing. One big, uh, there are a bunch of flaws with audio only, uh, but the one that irks me the most um, is discovery of content, right? Um, I'm supposed to remember commands. Oh. C can I just reply to that? Sure. No, you're not. You're not supposed to remember, and again, we can say, you know, if you like talking about video as a nascent technology, that's the nascent technology we have in audio, is right now we're talking about commands. Where we're going with this is that you're just going to have a conversation. Right. You're going to be able to, you know, like right now, you say, uh, turn the lights on. Okay, that's a very conversational thing. As we go forward, we'll be seeing all of these other conversational experiences just showing up. So it's no longer commands. But my point is, that actually constrains you with what you think you know. So if you have lights at home, yes, you can say turn on the lights. And until with you know using uh, some of the APIs that are available in the Google Cloud today, uh, dialogue flow and the other, we have the natural language understanding to help you achieve that. But what if I wanted to go outside of the comfort of things that I know? I want to discover something new. I don't want to be in my bubble. Then you ask a question. Then you just say something. Right? Visually, I'm able to sort of present Show me all My Little Ponies movies. Uh, tell me who the My Little Pony movies Tell me. Are. All right. Tell me. That's actually the command for. Tell me. Google. Tell me. Sorry. Show me. Sorry. Tell me. <laughs> show me. Tell me. Google. I'm oh, sorry. Show me My Little Pony characters. It's something that I actually do a lot at home. When I say that command to Google Home, which is an audio-only representation, I'm thankful that with visual displays that are coming soon. And with Google Cast today, I don't just get something, a uh, persona that's just disembodied, just talking at me with, well, this is Fluttershy, and she does this, and she looks like that. I actually can see what Fluttershy looks like. And by the way, I'm a Rainbow Dash kind of brony, so. Um, but, but I think what this is actually pointing to is, what we're really saying is that the technology that we're heading for, the transparent technology of our living room and our offices of the future, need both. So while Noble and I are taking very polar opposite sides, and this is why we've been such good friends for five years, is really, 
in the end, we meet in the middle. We realize that both of us use these extreme technologies. But where we're going is a living room where the technologies are transparent. Where, yes, you're going to have the home sitting in the corner listening to those ambient commands. Okay? But also, when you say things like, show me, your audio will hear it and show it to you on the TV, frictionlessly, transparently, and effortless, effortlessly, more effortlessly than me saying it. And I think that's where we come together in our different technologies, is how do we use voice to supplement video? How do we use video to supplement voice? And go Yeah, and, and so I'll leave you with this. Um, it's a story, uh, an inspirational example um, how many, by show of hands, how many of you guys are developers? I would hope every hand goes up. But if not, this is great. If you're ever thinking about building uh, emerging, on emerging technology platforms, uh, last year I gave an anecdote, uh, an idea out there. No one actually took me, on, uh, took me up on it. Um, an idea that actually combines audio, the concept of an intelligent assistant, and then visual representation. And she's called Annie. She's, she's the ghost girl. I'm going to set the stage. So imagine, close your eyes if you want. Um, imagine you're sitting in your living room and you say to your assistant, let's bring Annie into the room. Annie shows up. She's a ghostly looking girl standing by the curtains. But in this world, we're not we're sort of wearing a, 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 an AR device, let's say a Magic Leap style device, where we, are, we can manipulate our environment. We see our room just like in any AR, but it's mixed reality in the sense that we can actually dim and control the lighting of the room, in a, in a sense, virtually. Annie's standing there, and she's pointing. I'm thinking she's pointing at me. Brings chills uh, behind my neck, right? Um, down my spine, and I go, What's this and what are you doing? I realize she's not pointing at me, she's actually pointing past me. I turn around and it's a dead body. I turn back and he's gone. And there's a note on the dead body when I turn back. I'm interacting with this note. I'm able to read it, I'm able to ask Google or my assistant, what should I do now? This is an experience, this sets the stage for a continuous experience. One day, Annie could just sit right next to you, watch football with you, give you ideas uh, on, on why she's there. But she never really tells you who that dead body was or why she's here in the first place. You have to discover that. To me, that is sort of taking the inputs of audio and taking the visuals in my environment, taking that with me. Let's say Annie goes, one day gives me a clue. At the end of the chapter, she says, go outside, you'll see my brother. Tell him I love him. So I go, well, this is different. I've never had this experience. I put on my fancy glasses and I go outside. And surely enough, my brother said, her brother says, tell her it's too late. And then you can imagine what happens from that. You can discover things, you can interact with things. You can actually take what we know today and sort of remix it. I'm still waiting for someone to come to me with an idea as to how to realize this. This story, as I started putting it together, inspired by another similar story that you can probably find in the name slips me uh, on the Google Assistant store. What is it called? The Google Assistant. Directory. The, the directory, let's change it. Um, you can find that audio and video working together with gestures, screens, audio-only sources can be magical. They can be transformative. So again, we bet the future on Google Glass several years ago. Uh, so take our soothsaying and our, our oracle, you know, futurists uh, playing with a grain of salt. But we really think uh, that when technology disappears and just shows up 
when you need it by command. I was gonna, one of one of the slogans we had back in the class days, and we've heard it repeated many, many times by people from both Google and Apple and everywhere else, is uh, the beauty of Glass was that it was there when you needed it and out of the way when you don't. And we think all the technologies that we're working with today, again, meet those needs. They are there when you need it, they are there for you, but then they disappear transparently into the background and work with you in the background and are again there for you at your command. If you want, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, I'll, I'll, go ahead. One well, last thing. If you want to sort of learn more about building for Assistant, uh, certainly check out Alan's uh, GitHub. Uh, he is there to help. We're all G we're both GDEs, and, and for at least for uh, Assistant and, and, and Dialogflow and, 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 and that whole suite of products that uh, for actions for Google, uh, you can't miss him when you're on his. Yes, and I have, staff. A, I have a code lab this afternoon. You're all welcome to come to it. Right. So. And on the, I'm a product manager uh, and product strategist at NDI. If you want to read more about um, the ubiquity of connected things, um, you can find my uh, Medium page uh, or my Twitter, uh, where I, I, I post a lot of this, uh, stuff to or publish all of my, my, my writing to. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we talked about today and how to realize you know, things that are possible and building things that matter. And I, and I think that's really it. For us, it's about building things that matter. We want to help you build things that matter. So with that, we'll take any questions. Thanks very much.